Why am I here? Because I need to be sure. Because I need to see this through to the end and be sure that this farce ends once and for all. That man, that Jesus of Nazareth, who does he think he is? The Son of God? A heretic, a false prophet, a blasphemer. But not the Son of God. If he is the Son of God, then let's see him get down from that cross and save himself. He saved others. Let's see him save himself. He claims to be sent from God. Well, if that's true, then surely God will save him. Yes, let him come down from that cross. And then, then I will believe him. Believe how could so many people follow this man so blindly? This, this low life from Nazareth of all places, who eats with sinners and associates with the likes of tax collectors and prostitutes, who desecrates the temple and dishonors the Sabbath. As if God would send a Messiah such as this, No, no, he is a dangerous man who has already misled too many of our people. It had to be done. I've made the right choice. It is my responsibility to protect the sanctity of our faith. And Jesus, he stands against all that we hold sacred. My hands are clean. The Romans will finish this. And then finally we'll be rid of that pretender. And then maybe we can return to our lives in peace. Yes, peace. Who is John the Apostle, also called St. John the Evangelist, or St. John the Divine? John the Apostle was the son of Zebedee, a well-to-do Galilean fisherman. And he's the younger brother of James, who called himself also a disciple of Christ. According to church tradition, their mother was Salome, and she was among those women who nurtured and ministered to the circle of disciples. John was born about 6 AD and likely the youngest of the 12 apostles. And he was somewhere between 21 and 24 years old when Jesus began his adult ministry. And John became the longest living apostle and the only one not to die a martyr's death. Both of the brothers, John and James, were characterized by their zeal and their passion and ambition. In the early days with Jesus, they sometimes acted very rashly, recklessly, impetuously, and aggressively. We see John and Mark forbidding a man to cast out demons in Jesus' name because he was not part of the Twelve. Jesus gently rebuked him. In Luke, we see the brothers wanting to call down fire from heaven and destroy the Samaritan town and those who refused to welcome Jesus. Again, Jesus had to rebuke them for their intolerance and lack of a genuine love for the lost. 
John's zeal for Jesus was also influenced by his natural ambition. And this was seen when he and his brother are asked to be seated at the right and left hand of Jesus. John's rash request for such special honor later gave way to a level of compassion and humility that would characterize his ministry and life. And despite these youthful indiscretions, John was part of the inner circle with Peter and James. And John was given the privilege of witnessing Jesus' conversation with Moses and Elijah at the Mount of the Transfiguration and other important events. John is also called the Apostle of Love. In his gospel, he never refers directly to himself and although he's not directly associated with his name in the gospel, we knew that John was also the one called the beloved disciple, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And he's also depicted as the one leaning against Jesus' breast at the Last Supper in a physical display of his closeness and love for Jesus. And in spite of his youthful expressions of misdirected passion while following Christ, John matured into a true disciple, and he gradually became to understand that the need for humility in those who desire to be great is only accomplished by being a servant to all. John is the only gospel that records Jesus washing the disciples' feet a simple act of servanthood that must have impacted him greatly. So why was he at the cross? Jesus clearly prophesied about his coming passion, death, and resurrection, but the apostles seemed unwilling to accept this idea of his looming death, and they were even less disposed to embrace the idea of resurrection. This was true for 11. The one remarkable exception is the man who stood beneath the cross of Christ in support of his close friend. This is the disciple Jesus loved and who unhesitantly believed that Jesus was and is the Son of God. So why was John there when all the others left except for a few women who followed Christ? The easy answer is John loved Jesus. John was unafraid because he was known by the soldiers and others, having been present when that high priest faced Jesus, Caiaphas. John also understood that someone needed to remain, and not just to be a final witness for Christ, but to visibly support his friend through the final hours of his agony. Jesus was seen by John as caring for all the people and just not those who knew him. John saw all the miracles Jesus had performed, all the love shown to the least of these, all the times Jesus was there for him and his brothers and sisters in their time of need. Jesus loved John and John loved Jesus and he would not abandon him. That's why John is at the cross. But I think it's not just John who wanted to be there for his friend, but the father also wanted John at the cross. And by the time of the crucifixion, Jesus had enough confidence in John to turn the care of his mother over to him, a charge John took very seriously. And from that day on, John cared for her as if she were his own mother. It wasn't previously announced to John that he would take responsibility for the mother of Jesus, but he was there, and he accepted that. And although John remained courageous and bold throughout the ordeal of that day, God had plans for him beyond John was still a very young man. Finally, his ambition won and was now balanced with the humility he learned at Jesus' feet. The love, truth, 
and with courage and humility, these are all the characteristics Jesus wanted his, his disciple that he loved to hold firmly to carry him through. And he sealed that at the, feet, at the foot of the cross so that John could go out to love and serve all the world in the name of his most precious friend, of Jesus. Why am I here? I'm here because he's my son, because I bore him in my womb, because his life matters, and so does his death. Because the angel told me that he would be more than my son, he would be the son of the living God. I am here because this is my place beside him. I am here because my heart is torn asunder in a thousand pieces because I must accompany him all the way to the end. I am here because he needs to see and feel my love. Where else can a mother be? I am here, my son. I'm here because I'm a robber. A plunderer, some would say. And I was caught. And now I find myself hanging on this cross because of the things I've done. I guess you would call them crimes, but I wouldn't because I hate the Romans. When I look around, honestly, all I see are Roman soldiers, betrayers of Israel. They are the plunderers, not me. Why should they be able to take what doesn't belong to them? Yes, okay, I'm a rebel. I believe the world belongs to those of us who are shrewd and that God does not exist. If he did, would we as a people be treated the way we're being treated? Where is this Messiah we were promised? Where is this king that's supposed to deliver us? Is it this man, this man that's hanging next to me praying? If he's the Messiah, why is he praying? Why doesn't he just climb down off this cross and wave his arms and rid ourselves of these wicked Romans? Man's ego alone is king. Look, I'm guilty of the things that they said I did, but so what? How many other people commit so-called sins and nothing ever happens to them? Between me and you, I believe this God thing, this Messiah thing, was invented to keep us quiet. I've heard people talk about spiritual blessings, and maybe there were a few instances where I've outwardly confessed something I've done, but nothing ever happened. Did I ever receive any forgiveness? Not that I can tell. I've lived a tough life, but I've come through it all except, I guess, for being on this cross. I know you probably think I deserve to be here, and I know what you're thinking, but why am I expected to put my life in another man's hands? Why would I put my trust in a man? He's just a man like me. Maybe he didn't do what I did, but he's just a man. Believe me when I tell you that I've trusted men before, and they've let me down. I don't trust any of them. I certainly can't trust him, and I certainly won't trust him. I will not put my life in his hands. I can no longer wait for our supposed God to take care of things for me. 
Sure, I'll pay for my own sins, but that doesn't mean I have to trust anyone. And right now, all I'm interested in is getting off this cross. This man next to me may have done nothing wrong, but what do I care? My partner in crime over there on the other cross worries about being remembered. Remembered for what? Seriously? If this is the Christ who can save others, let him save himself. I certainly don't hear the Spirit of God calling me to repentance or acceptance of his forgiveness. I look down and see so many of you, and in your eyes, I don't see that you believe this man next to me to be the Christ. And people say, this man here is the king of the Jews. Sure, I hear him pray. I witness the supposed salvation of this other thief. I see the world going dark, more than likely a storm that's coming. But how can I identify with a man that hasn't lived my life? I hear the claims that he's the son of God. I see the sign above your head saying, Jesus the Nazarene, the king of the Jews. Well, prove it. Save yourself and us if you want people to believe you. Listen, forget this praying stuff and asking to be remembered. I want the torturers to think that I'm just like them, joined to the world with no love for God. Maybe they'll free me. If I escape from here with my physical body intact, I can take care of the rest of me. Besides, what else is there after life? My name is Mary, and I am often called the Magdalene because of the city where I lived for much of my life. I was well known there, and in many of the surrounding areas as well, mostly because of the trade that allowed my family to gain considerable wealth. But there was another reason I became well known in that area, and that has to do with the reason I'm here now, at this cross. Why am I here? Because when I met this man, Jesus, my life was miserable and I was lost. I had sought an easy life, but as time went on, there were things that tormented me from inside and from out. And I don't know how I became their residence, but my life was out of control. And it wasn't easy for me to hide the effects of how those tormenting demons were more in possession of me than I was of myself. I may have been rich and had everything I needed to be comfortable in this life, but there was no real life for me. And many of my family who had been close to me, were beginning to desert me. That was why, when we heard that the rabbi named Jesus, who some were already calling a great prophet and man of God, when we heard he was coming near us in Galilee, those of my friends who still supported me made sure that I would be in a place where he would be passing by. I was afraid I was sure that he would not stop to see me, but he seemed to know I was there, almost as if he were the one seeking me out. He came close, and he rested his hand on top of my head, and then his hands were on my face, and something happened then which I never expected. I was healed. He healed me. He gave me life. And he commanded seven demons to come out of me that day and leave me forever. Can you imagine? Seven demons. Seven of them inside of me. And then just like that, they were gone. All I had to do was say yes to him and know him as my Lord and my Redeemer. 
I had never felt such relief, such gratitude, and such love in my whole life. This Jesus, he freed me from bondage, and even more, he invited me to follow him. Despite my doubts and fears, I knew it was a call I could not refuse. And where is that man, Jesus, now? That great teacher? He's here, not far away on that hill they call Golgotha, hanging from a Roman cross. We stood not far away when the soldiers were pounding the nails into his hands. Each blow of the hammer, each scream of agony and pain that he couldn't hold back, every time the nails were pounded deeper, it was almost more than I could bear. Those precious hands that had touched me with such gentle healing kindness only a few short years ago, delivering me from the anxiety and the torment I had lived with for so long, those precious hands are now nailed to a cross. I followed him all the way from Galilee because I believed he had come to set us all free. And so these nails have been the worst thing of all. They are so final. Since this nightmare began, when they told us he'd been arrested, I was still clinging to the hope that he would be set free and that we would all go on as before. I could picture it in my mind so clearly. I was sure something would happen to set everything right. But after those nails went into his hands and feet, there was no hope left. And I wonder how this can be. Even now, it doesn't feel real. How can we have hope now that anything will ever change when he will be dead and gone? Part of me had imagined he would never die and we would walk the earth, he would walk the earth long after the rest of us were gone to dust. So what is the point now of any of us going on? alone without him. But we must. We have our lives and our duties to care for one another. And when his breath is finally gone and this nightmare is finally over for him, then I and the other women will do what must be done to care for his body, for the comfort of his mother and his family, and even for his disciples, I will do what I can. I'm worried that it's getting late, and the other Mary agrees with me. But if we cannot finish before sundown, we will go back after Shabbat is over and finish the required preparations then for his burial. I am here at the cross because I love him. Because he is my Lord, my Savior, he freed me. He was the only one who looked into my life and saw the potential and not what I was at that moment. I'm here to be with his mother and the other women. I'm here because I need to be here. Where else could I be but with my Lord? He showed me the truth about who I really am, who I was created by our Father in heaven to be. How could I do anything else but follow him? Give so much of all I had in this world to support him and all of us who were following him together. It wasn't easy, but I have gone with him, even here until the end. And I will keep on going as far as the road will lead because I believe that despite what has been so cruelly done to him, that those of us who he has healed and loved and taught have new life because of him. And that is why he came to us. I will bear witness to all these things, to my knowledge of him as Messiah, as son of God, as healer and teacher and friend and redeemer. I will bear witness for the rest of my life. So, that is why I'm here.
Why am I here? My whole life I've been a thief. I've stolen and I've looted to get by. But how else could I survive? The Romans, they strike us, they take our land, and they tax us to death. I knew no skill, no trade, and the only way to stay alive was to steal from those that had taken everything from us, from me. I don't believe it anymore. That other thief, he may believe that. He may try to justify his actions, but I can't. At the end of my life, I realize that I have no excuse for the crimes I've committed. I deserve to be condemned and executed for my evil deeds. My one wish is that I could repent for what I have done. This man next to me, Jesus, what has he done wrong? Some say he's the Son of God, the Messiah. I've heard that he's preached peace and forgiveness to all men. I've heard that he's performed miracles and even raised someone from the dead. Are these crimes? What could someone like that do to deserve death? My heart is broken over the ill deeds I've committed in my life. Could this man next to me really be the Son of God? Maybe if I can reach out to him to ask for forgiveness, I can be at peace with myself. This other criminal mocks him. He's so full of anger and rage, and he rejects God. Doesn't he fear God? Doesn't he know that we're all under the same sentence of condemnation? We too are indeed justly receiving the rewards for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. You want to know why I'm here? It was then the high priest and his cohorts and that crowd they drag everywhere with them, always complaining, always talking about their law. We give them stability. We give them swift justice, a hundred years of great military honor. And all they do is tell us that their God is the only God. And they refuse to show respect for our emperor. And today, today they wanted Barabbas. Seven years it took us to catch that murderer, a really bad man. And this morning, the governor gave them the choice to pardon the one they call Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, or he would pardon Barabbas, the murderer. I know what Pilate was thinking. Everybody knows how bad Barabbas is. Nobody wants him on the streets or in the country. But the one who talks about God likes kids, does miracles, and heals sick old women. Any reasonable person in Jerusalem would have chosen him over Barabbas. But those guys packed the courtyard with a bunch of loudmouths who drowned out the ordinary folks. Barabbas! Give us Barabbas! Pilate was over a barrel. What about this man? 
Crucify him! Crucify him! What has he done? He's broken our law! It's your law. Deal with him yourselves. You Romans won't allow us to stone anybody who says they are equal to God. To be a king higher than the emperor. Well, you know what Pilate did? He washed his hands right there in front of the whole crowd. The blood of Yeshua, Jesus of Nazareth, is on your hands. That's when Pilate looked at me and gave me the sign. And I was under orders to get him whipped. I had to prepare the squadron. I had to make a sign for everybody to read. I had to take Yeshua to the barracks and get him ready. And now I'm here in charge of his execution. Once I'd made the arrangements for this hill outside the gates and the squad leaders got the equipment ready, I went down and saw how the troops were treating him. It's not easy to get them to kill somebody respectable, somebody who deep down they know is good. But we let the mean ones beat him and torture him. And they did. They even made a ring of thorns and pushed it on his head like a crown. And he took it all and never said a word back at them. Halfway through the march out here, he fell down a bunch of times and I had to get a man from the country. He looked strong to carry the cross. By the time my men got him here, he and the others, by the time they got them on the crosses, it was noon and it was time to wait for them to die. That's when it got dark. Right in the middle of the day, I couldn't tell why, but it was as dark as night over the whole countryside. Well, my time's almost up, but I want you all to know I've seen a lot of people die. I've had to kill some myself, whether it was in battle or best peacekeeping or just following orders. But this man is different. We can make him hurt and bleed just like every other man, but I watched him refuse the painkillers. I heard him ask forgiveness for us when we nailed him up. I saw his mother there with his friends and followers and heard what he said to that guy I put up next to him. And now they want us to hurry it up. Because at sundown, the locals will start their Passover feast. Nobody left up over the weekend. 
and we have to break their legs so they can't push up to breathe. So they'll die quicker. So, there he is. Of the three of them, he's pretty well done already. I think we've made a terrible mistake. It's getting harder for him to take the pain. This whole mess is beyond me. And it hurts him so much just to breathe. 